Hey, Kirsten. Hi. Yeah. Hi, hi, Rick. Good evening. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, here we all are. Uh, yeah. We are still waiting for um, you know what. Oh my hey. God. Yes. <laughs> Well, we're we're breathing the news in the air now. You know, it's it's just uh, <laughs> all around us. Every sensation is news. <laughs> so apparently, it's depending on a couple states now. We'll see. Yeah. Okay, I think we can start. So it is a second lecture of Elizabeth. I'm happy to give you a microphone, please, Elizabeth. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks again for coming. Uh, I know it's very late for some of you. So um, yeah, so thanks. Um, so I'll continue yesterday uh, with uh, wh where we stopped yesterday. So we were looking at, uh, so K was a convex body in RN. And we were, uh, looking at the affine surface area of K, which um, a priori is defined as the integral over the boundary of K of the Gauss curvature kappa raised to the power one over N plus one. And we integrate with respect to the usual surface area measure on the boundary of K. And then, um, so uh, as kappa was the Gauss curvature, we saw that there is a problem uh, a priori because this definition only makes sense if the Gauss curvature exists, which happens only if K has enough smoothness properties. Uh, but I uh, yesterday already uh, showed or indicated some of the nice properties that the affine surface area has. And so uh, one really wants to have this concept available for all convex bodies. So there were attempts made or uh, successful attempts made to extend this concept to all convex bodies and not just the ones that have um, enough uh, smoothness. Um, and uh, I only want to mention some, so extensions to all convex bodies. Due to uh, Leichtweiss, uh, Ludwig, and many more. Um, I'll um, briefly write down uh, the um, Ludwig um, uh, extension. Uh, so what Irving proposed is the following. Um, he um, uh, says that, uh, okay, let's define the affine surface area of K as follows. We look at the infimum over all L, where L is a star body um, and zero is in the interior of L. So, um, uh, and we, uh, he suggests to take the infimum of what? N times the volume of K to the power one over N. And then we integrate over the boundary of the ball. Uh, that is, we integrate over S N minus one, D sigma uh, K of U over um, rho L of U. And um, everything gets raised to the power N over N plus one. So let me explain what everything is here. So uh, sigma K in, so, so this sigma K is a measure on the sphere. So if we take a subset A on the sphere, then sigma K of A is actually mu K of um, the Gauss map and K, um, the Gauss map in K, but here we have to take uh, the inverse of the Gauss map because we march back uh, to the boundary of uh, the body. Um, so we'll take the inverse of A under the Gauss, uh, under uh, the inverse of the Gauss map and apply uh, the usual surface area measure to it. So that's um, what this measure sigma K is. And um, what else? Uh, so rho L that uh, we had already defined uh, this is the radial function. So we had defined that yesterday. And um, now what is a star body? 
Uh, so L is a star body. If uh, um, it has continuous positive radial function, and um, and L is star shaped with respect to zero. So that means if we look at the line segment, um, zero X for X in K, no, in L, then, sorry. So if we look at the line segment zero X, so for X in L, we look at the line segment uh, zero X, so that's the line segment that joins zero to X, this must be in L. So it looks like so. Oh, okay, maybe not quite. We have zero in there uh, for, for a point X. Uh, in L, this line segment must be in L. That's a star, uh, that's a star body. So if we look at this definition or at this suggestion, uh, which is of course a good suggestion uh, of um, extending affine surface area to all convex bodies, um, that's uh, a bit, it looks a bit complicated. And uh, likewise, uh, um, extension equally looks a bit complicated. So I want to propose a third approach um, and that is um, uh, given in the next theorem. which is due to uh, Carsten and myself. And it says, um, okay, let K be a convex body in Rn. Then the limit as delta goes to zero. So what do we look at now here? We look at the volume difference of K minus K delta divided by delta to the two over n plus one. This limit exists and is equal to, give me a second here, I'm just checking something. Okay, uh, I was just uh, seeing if I had already told that yesterday, I wasn't sure anymore. So, um, um, okay, so we look at this volume difference uh, between the body K and the floating body, uh, and we'll divide by this delta to the two over n plus one, and we look at the limit as delta goes to zero, then this limit exists and is equal to a constant Cn, um, which we know exactly times the integral over the boundary of K uh, of now um, I'm writing here kappa to the one over n plus one d mu K. And um, of course, if we have a general convex body K then kappa cannot be uh, the Gauss curvature. So what we have put here kappa is the generalized Gauss curvature. Which coincides with the usual Gauss curvature curvature if this one exists. And Cn is the constant that we had uh, uh, seen already before. It is one half n plus one over uh, the n minus one dimensional volume of the n minus one dimensional uh, Euclidean unit ball raised to the power two over n plus one. Okay, uh, so um, let's comment a little bit on this. Uh, I'll say something about this generalized Gauss curvature in a moment, um, but um, but uh, let's see that. Uh, so 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 uh, so so what can we uh, what can we say from what can we conclude from this? So uh, we can conclude from this that we can use uh, use as a definition. 
for affine surface area for all convex bodies bodies uh, the left hand side the left hand side the left hand side limit and by extension uh, because uh, the left hand side limits equal to the right hand side um, uh, we can uh, uh, write it also as it's written here uh, on the right hand side with this generalized gout curvature um, so that would give another definition of affine surface area but there are the ones uh, uh, around given uh, to us by Leichtweiss and Ludwig and uh, all the definitions uh, all definitions or all extensions coincide. So otherwise things would be a bit unpleasant. Now, if we look at uh, this, the way how we um, can express uh, affine surface area, namely um, as this limit of this volume uh, difference, uh, from here, we'll see right away, right away several things. So what do we see uh, from this definition here? So for one, we understand, um, now we understand, we see that that affine surface area is an affine invariant. Sorry, Elizabeth, but for me, it, it, is, it is still not a definition because is it always that uh, for any convex body, this limit exists? Yes, this is the theorem. The theorem says for all convex bodies, uh, K, this limit here exists. And it's equal to the right-hand side expression where uh, now the function that we've put here, well, is in general not the Gauss curvature, but what we call the generalized Gauss curvature. So what I'll do is I'll um, give an idea of the proof that the limit exists and uh, how uh, you know we get uh, to the right hand side, which can be seen as a generalized Gauss curvature. Uh, okay. That, that that answers your question. Uh, yes, thanks. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll give um, a, a sketch of the proof of the theorem that will make things maybe even clearer. Mm -hmm. But before I wanted to um, tell that um, from this definition, some things are already explained uh, concerning notation and name. So uh, let me do that first and then start with proving the theorem. And well, and then I'll be talking about gen what's the generalized Gauss curvature, and then I'll give an idea of the proof of the theorem. So that's the plan. Okay, so um, so so now what I'm saying is once we have this theorem, this uh, explains that um, the name affine surface area makes sense. Uh, namely, that firstly, what I want to uh, show is that. Uh, the name uh, or the, the, the word affine in the name makes sense. Um, namely, uh, as I already said, the affine surface area is an affine invariant. And we see that if you know, we have this theorem and take this as, as a definition of affine surface area, which we'll see in, in, a little bit later, because uh, it involves this volume difference and that is actually um, affine invariant. So, uh, so if we accept that as a definition for starters, then we would have that the affine, so let T be a, so let T be a, an affine map with determinant different from zero then, okay, let's accept for the moment we have the theorem, then um, affine surface area of T of K is according to limit delta goes to zero of, then we have the volume of TK minus TK and uh, affine, uh, the floating body of TK 
divided by delta to the two over n plus one. So we'll have to think about um, the, uh, so we have to think about what is actually this thing here. But that is not hard because um, let's take TK and let's look at what is TK delta. That is the floating body of TK. So we have to look at hyperplanes H that cut off delta from TK. So we have that delta is equal to TK inter, I think we said H minus here, H minus and the volume. And that's of course the same as TK intersected with T, T to the minus one H minus. And that is of course equal to the determinant of T uh, absolute value, volume of K intersected. So T minus, T inverse um, applied to H minus is a new hyperplane, let's call it H twiddle minus. So we'll get K into H twiddle minus volume. So we see that if um, um, the hyperplane H, if there is a hyperplane H that cuts off delta from uh, TK, that corresponds to a hyperplane H twiddle that cuts off delta over determinant uh, T from uh, K and vice versa. So we see that uh, actually TK delta is K delta over determinant T. And of course we have to apply T to this. So we can replace up here, uh, limit delta goes to zero. We can uh, replace TK delta by TK with a uh, floating body of K with index delta over determinant T. So let me bring out the determinant T right away again, and we'll get K minus K delta over determinant T volume. And then we divide by delta, but okay, as our um, uh, parameter, delta parameter for K now is this one, we want to make it uh, uh, appear also uh, in the denominator in the right way. So we should put delta uh, divided by determinant T and this raised to the power two over N plus one, but then we have to correct it and multiply uh, uh, here by determinant T uh, to the two over N plus one. And we'll get exactly uh, the right um, uh, homogeneity for, um, uh, for the determinant t, namely we'll get determinant t, um, and then we'll have um, n minus one over n plus one, and then f and surface area of k. So this shows that, um, so this shows the f and invariance property, which was not at all obvious, um, like when we had this expression here, which um, uh, in the original definition just involved the uh, usual Gauss curvature. Uh, so that was not at all obvious that we actually have the affine invariance. But now it's obvious with this um, uh, representation as a, a, a volume difference. And also we see what you asked last time, Dima, now is uh, easy to see with this relation because last time I told you um, what is the floating body of a ball. Uh, of the Euclidean unit ball. So I told you it's again a ball and we can actually write down the radius. So we did that last time. And you were asking if we can, uh, you know, write down floating bodies for uh, uh, other bodies than the ball. And uh, I had also done the L infinity ball in two dimensions. Um, and, uh, and now you see with this relation here that gives us the floating body uh, for ellipsoids because ellipsoids are um, affine images uh, of um, of the Euclidean ball. Okay. It gives uh, it gives uh, affine surface area. It it uh, about the affine surface area uh, because it's an affine invariant. It, there is just the determinant coming in. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, uh, this is just. Uh, uh, how, how yeah, but how it? does it give the shape of, of the body? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. The thing is, okay, so maybe I write it. So, so we know, so epsilon, right, uh, which is an ellipsoid, this can be written as, uh, you know, an, an affine image uh, of the Euclidean ball, right? 
So mm -hmm. if I look at this, right, then uh, from what we have just seen, that is T, uh, this. Mm. Right? Ah, okay, okay. So and uh, so it's uh, it's it's an ellipsoid again, right? It's an ellipsoid ah, again. Okay, okay, yeah. I because see. this mm -hmm. one we had computed mm -hmm. last time, um, and that was one minus oh, okay. delta over. Um, now I have to put determinant t, but of of course, if we know the ellipsoid, we know this map uh, t, right? Yes, so, sure. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get this because we have computed that last time, so we get that uh, now. How many brackets do I put? I guess I put a bracket here and here. Okay, and so okay, I see, yes. It's uh, again an ellipsoid, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And, um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, here, uh, uh, where did I, here, uh, we know also for ellipsoid, we'll get, uh, it's the determinant that comes in, you know, how I have indicated here, because if K is an uh, ellipsoid, then the affine surface area of the ellipsoid will be just the affine surface area of T times the ball, right? And if we know the ellipsoid, we know uh, T, and then it comes just in as the determinant and then affine surface area of the ball, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so that's May I also ask a question? Sure. May I also ask a question? Sure. Uh, so this Gaussian curvature, the generalized Gaussian curvature, is it a function or a measure? What is it originally? Uh, can you pay, uh, can you be uh, waiting a little bit longer? Then I'll explain what it is. Okay. Is, is that okay? That okay? It's okay. Yes, it's okay. 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 So um, right. So uh, now we understand uh, the affine invariance. And now let me also, in case you wondered why it's called, so affine's clear now, why the word affine's there. But in case you wondered why one says surface area, that basically also um, is explained if we look at, uh, or if we take this as the definition of affine surface area, namely, that's of course motivated by, um, so there is Minkowski definition, definition of usual surface area. As a variation of volume, namely what did Minkowski do? He said that, okay, for a you know, general convex body K, the surface area of K is the limit, let's say epsilon goes to zero of K plus epsilon times the Euclidean ball. So we uh, add on the epsilon times the Euclidean ball, take the volume and subtract the volume of the Euclidean ball and um, divide by epsilon. So uh, how does that look like? So here we have our body, we add on uh, epsilon balls, we'll get a new body, and then we'll look at um, this difference. That is what we look at when we uh, look at this here. And um, according to a Minkowski definition, and that's actually one convinces oneself uh, easily of this, that this give, gives the surface area of the body uh, by first looking at a polytope and the general case follows by approximation of convex bodies by polytope. So one easily sees that this really gives the surface area starting to look at polytopes. And now we have, a, and, and now we have, now uh, we also have, have a variation, have a variation of volume, which is a uh, looks a bit different but as it's also a variation of volume, uh, which not gives the usual uh, surface area, but something else uh, that uh, why it's called uh, affine surface area, because it's in addition um, uh, affine um, invariant. So this uh, new variation of volume that uh, uh, we have now is this one. So that uh, that's just to explain in case you wondered why, um, why it's called affine surface area. So that, that explains this. And now let me go to, um, 
let me uh, uh, explain uh, what this generalized Gauss curvature. Okay, so let me explain this. And uh, first, um, I want to say that um, um, so so. Let me say first that we cannot expect we cannot expect that Gauss curvature exists for I'll do an um, um, an easy case first uh, for every point on the boundary of a convex body K. So what's the easy example that I'm doing first? It's an example in the plane. So we look at, um, so we look at the function uh, y equals x squared. And then what I take is I'll take points uh, one over n. So on, on this, so I'll take on this function points one over n, one over n squared. So I take that point and then I have one over n plus one, this point, and I keep going and uh, we'll take the convex hull. And this describes as part, uh, so the, this describes as part of the boundary of a convex body. Then uh, it's uh, easy to see that, of course, um, a first derivative um, exists um, um, so, so the point that we are talking about here is the point zero, where so f oh, no I said y so y prime of, of of zero of course exists and is equal to zero, but uh, y okay let let me write it and then I'll comment but y double prime of zero does not exist because in every neighborhood of zero you'll find points where the first derivative does not exist, namely these points that are the vertices of the body. So in every neighborhood, you'll find points where the first derivative does not exist. So you cannot perform uh, the second derivative. Now, um, and the second derivative, of course, is related to the Gauss curvature because Gauss curvature, if the boundary of the convex body is described by a function, then the Gauss curvature is just the second derivative at the point in question divided by one plus first derivative to the square root of the point in question to the three over two. So, um, so that shows that at that point, uh, at the point zero of the boundary of this convex body constructed as the convex hull of taking those points, uh, the Gauss curvature does not exist. But then one can uh, even construct uh, something uh, uh, worse. And, and I'm just, so, so basically one can repeat this procedure that we did here around zero. One can repeat such a procedure to get a convex body K so that at no point on the boundary of this body, the second derivative exists. So um, no Gauss curvature in the generalized sense exists. Good. So, so we need. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand the point of this example. Uh, you say that the second derivative not exist, and hence the Gaussian derivative doesn't exist in the yes. parabola example. But there are even if you just take any point without the first derivative. So the the I, I don't know the absolute value function. Then even the first derivative doesn't exist. So wh why is not uh, why is this example not? Not enough, right? Um, because in, in the yeah. Gaussian curvature, there is first. That's right. If I wanted to right? take just one point, um, uh, if I just wanted to take one point, um, it, it, that's right. But what one wants to do is the effect that we have produced here. One wants to produce now. Um, to get a convex body where on every point of, uh, so where you get, so we, we one can construct, one can um, repeat such a procedure, so one can construct, mm -hmm. where such a phenomenon happens for countably many dense 
for accountably many dense set on the boundary. Mm -hmm. So one can construct a convex body. Okay. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm trying to say? Convex mm, body. Case. Not exactly, but okay, this probably answers the question. Yes. For every point uh, uh, which has um, so convex body K, uh, uh, which has um, has a, a countable dense set on the boundary, so which has a countable dense set on the boundary where um, the first derivative uh, or such that the first derivative such that the first derivative does not exist at any of those points. So like um, in this example here, where you find a neighborhood. Sorry, the first or the, se or the second? The, the, the first. So, so but, that, uh, in that means that, example. that means that, okay, so, so con the consequently at no point on the boundary, the second derivative exists. Ah, okay, okay. Uh -huh. The now boundary, yeah. Only the second derivative, second derivative exists. And how is this? So, so what's the phenomenon? Um, so um, the, the phenomenon, at, uh, so the countable dense set where the first derivative does not exist at any of those points that corresponds to like those vertices that we have taken here. Right? Okay, so it's, it's essentially an example of a convex function for which the first derivative doesn't exist at a dense set, something like that. Correct, something like that, so, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, so like if we were to take an arbitrary point on the body and we zoomed in, right, what we would observe, what we observe here around zero. So, um, yeah. Uh, well, I hope it has been made halfway clear. Uh, so now let's um, see what we have to take um, instead. So instead, so, so we really, we really, it's really not enough if we want to uh, consider um, like a um, affine surface area defined by some concept of uh, Gauss curvature, it's really not enough to take the usual Gauss curvature. We have to take something else. And what's the something else? So let's now move on to define um, this generalized Gauss curvature. And I'll do it also by going via functions. So we'll um, take U, which is uh, an open set uh, in Rn. And um, we'll take F that goes from U um, uh, to R and is convex. And we'll take uh, an x zero in u. Then so so um, and okay. So I'll I'll say it, but many of you may be familiar with uh, what's coming next. Um, so so why do we look at this? So we look at this first of all because we are talking about uh, convex bodies and not convex functions. But why do we look at this? Uh, we know uh, um, if we have a convex body, uh, uh, then so K, a convex body. Then locally, a K or the boundary of K can be described by a convex function. And that is what we are um, uh, using now here uh, when we uh, do the setup of defining this Gauss curvature using convex functions, because we know locally um, the boundary of a convex body can be defined by a convex function. So let's uh, talk about convex functions for the moment. So we'll have the setup um, that um, F is a convex function defined on an open set U and we'll pick a point X zero in U. Then 
uh, I'll denote it like so. Df of x0 is called uh, subdifferential. of f um, at x0 if the following happens. Um, if for all x in u, we'll have that um, f of x0 plus, um, so, so actually I should have said that this is a vector in Rn. And, um, and if f is differentiable, what can we think, how can we think of this df uh, if f is differentiable at that point, then this is nothing else but the gradient of f. So, uh, but now we'll uh, talk about subdifferential. So for all x in u, we'll have f of x0 plus uh, df of x0, x minus x0 in a product that's smaller or equal than f of x. So in other words, um, this equation here, like if I, if I put equality here, if I had equality here, then this equation here would nothing uh, is would describe nothing else but the support hyperplane to the graph of f at that point here x zero f of x zero. So that what this um, if we had equality, that what this equation here describes. Um, now um, uh, or there is a fact uh, which says uh, a first fact um, which says that if f u to r is convex, then, and that just follows by convexity, f has a subdifferential um, at every x in u. Actually, f is uh, almost f everywhere di uh, differentiable uh, on u. So that's the first thing that we need. Then the next thing that we need um, is uh, the following. So F is said to be twice differentiable uh, in a generalized sense. At x0 in u, if there is a linear map, um, I'll denote it, let's say, because the first one we had denoted with d, so let's write d squared f of x0 um, and a neighborhood uh, uh, u of x0. You mean linear or quadratic map? Linear. But it's d squared. So it's, it's not... The notation I use, if you don't like the notation, I use the second derivative. It's just a notation, it's nothing. It's a notation. Like, you know, I denoted by df, the okay. subdifferential, mm -hmm. I denoted like, so if you don't like it, but maybe you will not no, like okay, it. Okay, okay, I, I like it. <laughs> uh, okay. It's a notation, right? For the two stands for second, second, uh, so so to speak, derivative, um, and a neighborhood such that, um, such that what happens? Um, so such that the Euclidean norm df x such that uh, okay for all x in U of x zero, df of x minus df of x zero minus this uh, linear map applied to the vector x minus x zero uh, is smaller or equal than theta of x norm minus x zero norm, uh, x minus x zero norm, where theta is um, a monotone function I forgot to say something. Monotone function uh, uh, such that the limit as uh, of theta of t as t goes to zero is zero. So this is the definition, or that's what we say uh, or call twice differentiable in a generalized sense at um, at this point x zero, 
And one can see the example that I mentioned before, uh, where we looked at um, uh, taking points one over n, one over n squared on the curve y equals x squared. And it's not differentiable. One can check with this definition that, um, well, we saw that it's not differentiable at zero, twice differentiable at zero in the usual sense, but one can check with uh, this definition that it is um, twice differentiable at zero in this generalized sense, and that's not too hard to check. And um, now uh, let's uh, um, uh, let's uh, 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 give names to things. So um, uh, so maybe I should write that. Uh, so so uh, this uh, this the, the the previous the the previous example example is twice uh, differentiable in a generalized sense sense um, at zero and uh, okay and actually the this or um, maybe I should write f here then uh, is actually equal to two so which one checks easily Good, um, now this uh, linear map here, um, so d squared f x zero, or maybe um, uh, maybe more standard is uh, this notation uh, is uh, called the generalized Hessian. of f at x zero. And uh, now uh, we have a theorem which relates things back to um, uh, boundaries of convex bodies. So this is due to Bonnison and Fenchel in dimension three and to Alexandrov I hope I did write Alexandrov correctly for n bigger or equal than four. And it says um, the boundary of a convex body is twice differentiable in the generalized sense meaning that if we um, describe locally the boundary of the body by a convex function, then uh, in this sense, it's twice uh, uh, differentiable. And, um, uh, and then, so let's uh, draw a picture. So here's the boundary of our convex body. We write it locally. Let's take the, uh, uh, the, the, let's look at what happens at say, let's say this is zero. So we'll describe it, the boundary of the um, convex body locally around zero by a convex function f. And um, what this result of uh, Bonnes and Fenchel and Alexandrov says, so the boundary is twice differentiable in uh, the generalized sense. And then we'll put, uh, uh, and then we'll put that, and then the generalized Gauss curvature, Gauss curvature. So, so we, we've taken the point zero here. I could have taken any other point. So the generalized Gauss curvature kappa at zero is nothing else but the determinant of this uh, Hesse um, matrix, uh, generalized Hesse, Hesse matrix at zero. Okay, so that is uh, the, this concept of generalized Gauss curvature that we are using and that um, uh, is, uh, coming in in the theory. Okay, um, more questions to this? I don't understand the O term in the definition of the second derivative the o term? on the previous page. So does it? Yes. Ah, this one? So yes, the, the this rest term is somehow strange because 
if you take just the usual function, which is differentiable, then df is just the first derivative, right? Yes. And and then you would not get such a strong O term, right? You would get just capital O of of that, not not um, this theta, which goes to zero. If, I, I wonder whether this is satisfied for a twice differentiable function. It doesn't seem to be <laughs> satisfied because you have f prime of x minus f prime of x star uh, f zero minus second derivative times x minus x zero, and this should be well. This is not. I'm I'm pretty sure it's correct. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure it's correct. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's correct. And uh, um, let's uh, go on, and uh, okay. and mm -hmm. we can uh, think about it, or I can think about it. Uh, uh, yeah. But see, if if you take just the Taylor expansion, then what comes next would be the second term of the Taylor expansion. So it would be a quadratic function in x minus x zero, but it would be not such a theta of that, <laughs> right? But okay, anyway, it's it doesn't matter, of course. Let's put it. Uh, yeah. uh, let's go. Let's discuss it uh, uh, so that I. Uh, otherwise, we'll be discussing this till like uh, another half hour, and we. Uh, I will not be making any progress. But I'm pretty sure it's correct. Okay, go on. Just. Go. Um, and, uh, and due to this, uh, Alexander of theorem generalized Gaussian curvature always exists. Yeah. What, what was the question? Uh, so, uh, I mean, due to the Alexandrov theorem, uh, exactly. the generalized exactly. Uh, Gaussian. Due to, exactly. Due to Alexandrov theorem, this generalized Gaussian curvature always exists on the boundary of a convex body. Uh -huh. uh, just uh, in your previous page, one of the previous pages, it was a phrase, if it exists, uh, generalized Gaussian curvature. Uh, but okay, doesn't matter. So it, it always exists. Okay. It always exists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, uh, here you mean. Uh, I know what you mean. You mean uh, where? Where was it? Uh, uh, here I said, is the generalized with so. Yes, here, it, here, here. It coincides with the usual Gauss curvature if this exists, meaning that if the usual Gauss curvature exists. Ah, oh, it's usual. Okay, sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. So yeah. So so here I meant. Okay. The I, generalized I see, Gaussian always. I it, it, but it coincides with the usual Gauss curve, which is Ah. Okay. Okay. Gauss okay. Curve, yeah. Yeah. The mm -hmm. usual yes. Gauss curve. I can, I confused it. Okay. Thank you. Um. Okay. So um. So now, so now I have explained this, and um, we know that um, by uh, this theorem of um, uh, Alexandrov and Bonus and Fentil, um, the right hand side of our um, um, theorem also makes sense. And now let's start to prove the theorem. So, what we want to prove is the. I'm, limit. I'm sorry. So, the, the theorem says it exists everywhere or almost everywhere because the somehow. The theorem it's... says that um, the generalized Gauss, uh, almost everywhere. Yes. And so suppose we have a cube, mm -hmm. then the Gaussian curvature is zero on the facets of this cube, right? Correct. Inside the facets, it's always zero. Mm -hmm. So the function kappa you constructed in your definition of the affine surface area, is it zero then everywhere on the facets? And so that's uh, something I don't understand. Yes, so because we already said that um, what do we have? We have that we, we already said that for a polytop, right? Yeah. Um, for a polytop, okay, so let's write down the definition. So we would integrate over the boundary of the polytop what the Gaussian curvature is to the power of one over n plus one, and then we would write this, right? Now, and is what on the facets, is it's always zero. Right. Right. And um, the uh, lower dimensional phases, that is the, fas the phases that are of dimension n minus two and lower, they have measure zero. 
Right. So we'll we'll get zero here. Right. So for a polytope, and, and that's why I'm asking it. Oh, okay. It is zero for a cube, right? Okay. Ah. It's okay. zero. That's I okay. think I had mentioned that last time. Uh, getting okay, a bit ahead, I, I, I getting a bit ahead of myself. I had mm -hmm. said that um, um, you know, for polytops, the affine surface area is always zero, and um, uh, I had said that last time to illustrate the point that we cannot expect that the affine surface area is uh, continuous in the Hausdorff metric, uh, only upper semi-continuous. And um, we, we see that by looking at, uh, you know, the fact that for polytops, it's always zero, and that uh, every convex body can be approximated by polytops, uh, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. So, um, so let me now come to uh, give um, a sketch of the uh, proof of the theorem. So, um, so what do, do we want to look at? Uh, or what, what do we need to look at? So we need to look at uh, that expression here. Uh, that is the limit as delta goes to zero of this volume difference. Uh, so, and we'll need to show that this is equal to, uh, you know, what we had on the right hand side of the theorem. Now to, um, to handle that, what we first, uh, uh, what we first uh, do is a lemma. Uh, uh, I'm just seeing I'm getting hopelessly behind with the time. So what we'll uh, first do uh, is uh, looking at a lemma, which helps us to express this volume difference in a way that is suitable for us so that we can handle things. So uh, lemma one, in lemma one, we write, and that is a standard lemma that's really uh, nothing. Um, and we will assume, which we can do without loss of generality, that um, actually I want k delta, probably, yes. Uh, we will assume that zero is in the interior of k delta and that we can do uh, without loss of generality. Then I want to rewrite this volume difference k minus k delta. And actually I could have put uh, any other body L here, k delta is not important. So we can write that as uh, one over n, the integral over the boundary of k, then we'll have a boundary point and it's outer normal nx and we look at its inner product and then we have to multiply by one minus, um, I write x delta divided by x um, to the n. And we integrate with uh, the usual surface area measure d mu k. So that is uh, the lemma that we, uh, first lemma that we look at and that's really not hard uh, to, to understand why this identity holds. Um, if you think back what I um, uh, already said last time, I said that the volume of a convex body can be written like so, the integral over the boundary of K of inner product of a boundary point with its outer normal, like so. And how did that come about? That came about, uh, and we assume that zero is in the interior. We, that came about that we uh, summed up, so maybe I write one over in, in here. Uh, that came about because these things here, we can understand as uh, the volume of such little cones. And then we, we sum up all these little cones uh, going over the boundary of K. Now here, we look at a volume difference. So, uh, 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 so we have K here and we have K delta here. And uh, then uh, we, um, assumed also that zero is in the interior of K. So what we now do is we look at uh, differences of these little cones. So we will take, uh, here's D mu K. So we, we take the, the big cone, uh, which corresponds to looking at the volume of K and we subtract the little cone, which corresponds to the volume of K delta. And then we'll, um, you know, sum up all those differences going over the boundary of K, and that gives us the difference volume. Um, in, I can elaborate more, uh, or um, are people happy? Do they think that makes sense like so? Yeah, the, the idea is clear, but okay. maybe you, you can skip the details. Okay, good. So then let's move on. Um, and uh, so, so that is the first lemma. So, um, 
that means that uh, eventually we want to look at k minus k delta divided by delta to the two over n plus one, um, which um, now we see we can write as the integral over the boundary of k. And then I'll, uh, uh, maybe I'll need some space here, which we can write as the integral over the boundary of k. And I'll pull in the, um, the delta to the two over n plus one, I'll pull under the integral and um, with our first lemma uh, that would become, um, oh, sorry, I should have said, uh, here, is a, here is a X delta, uh, at least this I should have said, but this is even if I don't give you an idea. But, but, but the guess what, what it is. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you guys guess what it is? I, I thought it is the intersection of the segment zero X with the boundary of the K delta. Super, no, no. you are right. <laughs> so this, this is this, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we managed um, with our first lemma to write this. Uh, and, but now what we want is to look at the limit as delta goes to zero. So we'll have the limit here on both sides. So we'll have a first way how we have rewritten the volume difference, namely like so. And now what we would like to do, we would like to interchange integration and limit. And to, to do that, um, to do that, we want to use uh, the dominated convergence theorem. So what we have to do, what we want to show is that the functions under the integral here, so those functions are uniformly in delta and pointwise in X bounded by a function that is integrable over the boundary of K. So, uh, uh, so we need to find a dominating function um, uh, that is integrable. Um, on the boundary of K. And uh, to get such a function, uh, 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 we get this function uh, through a quantitative version of what's called the blaschke rolling theorem. Okay, so what is the blaschke rolling theorem? It says, uh, if we have, so let K be a convex body that is C2 plus, that is it has twice continuously differentiable boundary and the plus stands for that at every boundary point, the, um, well, in this case, it will be the usual Gauss curvature is strictly positive. So if we have such a body, then there is a Euclidean ball with radius R. Uh, that rolls freely in K. So what does that mean to roll freely in K? It means that if, uh, it means that for all X in the boundary of K, we have that, uh, so we look at the ball, at the Euclidean ball that's centered at X minus R uh, outer normal, NX, 
and has radius r. This is completely contained in K. So the picture is as follows. So we'll have a boundary point X. We have the outer norm NX. And then we'll look at the ball. So here we have R NX. And then this ball with the radius R that's centered here uh, completely sits in K. And that's happening. We can do this for every boundary point. Um, uh, a comment or remark. So, so here, um, Laschke made this assumption uh, that the body is C2 plus. Uh, one cannot do with much less. So uh, right away a remark, uh, which uh, uh, shows that um, to have a, a rolling ball, to have a ball, a ball that rolls freely in K, It is not enough that the boundary of K is C1. So that is not enough. And an example would be, um, um, uh, an example would be uh, look at um, Y equals uh, absolute value uh, of X and then uh, to be, uh, to make it uh, C1, let's take uh, the power four over three. So then uh, the boundary is C1. If this function de uh, describes locally the boundary of a convex body, but um, the, um, in the second derivative or the curvature, um, uh, the second derivative or the curvature uh, at zero um, goes, to, uh, goes to infinity. And consequently, so, so this would correspond to that the Gauss curvature at zero goes to infinity and uh, goes to infinity, which would correspond to because Gauss curvature at zero uh, is uh, uh, one over uh, the radius of a rolling ball uh, at that point uh, zero. And that would go uh, then consequently um, to zero. So we will have no rolling ball, ball existing um, if we just have C1. That is, you cannot put a ball here that's com that has strictly positive radius that sits completely in there. Um, so C1 is not enough, but um, in this um, uh, requirement C2 plus is of course too strong. Uh, and um, and um, in, for our purposes, uh, uh, not, uh, not, not good enough because not only uh, do we not want C2 plus, we not even want C1, we want a general convex body. And, um, and so, so, um, so, so why, why are we even bringing up this rolling theorem? We are bringing up this rolling theorem because it's actually a good concept because um, if we have such a rolling ball, and um, think what we are doing when we are looking at volume differences of K with a floating body, uh, in comes the floating body. So in comes uh, where we uh, cut um, sets of uh, volume delta from hyperplanes. So um, if we have such a rolling ball here, uh, which uh, uh, is provided to us by Plaschke's uh, theorem, if the body is smooth enough, then we can kind of control um, what's happening um, for the floating body by looking at what's happening for this rolling ball. So the rolling ball is actually a good concept to get a handle on this volume difference. So we want to have such a thing also available to us uh, in, in the general uh, situation. Um, that is when K is not necessarily C2 plus. And um, so we, uh, so what we did in order to get a handle on that is that we introduce uh, what we call the rolling function. So R, so rolling function we denote by R. So what's that? So the rolling function R is a map that goes from the boundary of K to R, actually R plus, and it sends uh, X, uh, a boundary point to Rx, uh, which is defined uh, as follows. So it's the sup, um, 
So it's defined as follows. It's the soup, I call it rho, overall rho, such that uh, the ball uh, centered uh, at x minus rho nx, so something similar uh, than we had here, if this is the boundary point, then um, I'll uh, take a boundary point x, outer normal nx, then I'll take now uh, a radius rho and I'll center it at uh, the ball with radius rho at x minus nx. And uh, we'll take the soup over all such rho so that this ball um, is still contained in k. And this we do if uh, nx is unique. So um, if nx is unique, then we will define r of x like so. And if r of x is not unique, uh, then um, uh, if n of x is not unique, then we'll put r of x equal zero. It, so uh, that's the definition of rolling ball. And um, um, I'll uh, make a few comments about that. Um, so, Note first, so uh, comments. So firstly, uh, so in this definition, we all took the soup um, and the soup is of course attained. So the soup is attained by uh, the Blaschke selection, Blaschke selection principle. Blaschke selection principle because we look at all those balls. Uh, so um, x given, we look at all those balls x minus r. Oh no, I said rho. Nx uh, rho. Uh, so we look at all such balls uh, over all rho that are contained in k. So we'll have uh, uniformly uh, in rho uh, 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 sets that are uh, contained uniformly in rho contained in a bounded set k. So by the Plaschke selection principle, uh, we know there exists a subsequence um, x rho uh, j, say nx rho j that converges uh, to a convex set mm, mm, L that will then also be contained in K. And of course, uh, 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 so that converges in the Hausdorff metric, which means that uh, the row J's are actually converging to some say uh, uh, are converging and we call the limit Rx. And, um, and uh, consequently, uh, this L is again a ball and with this radius Rx. So that follows by the Blaschke selection principle that the soup is attained. Um, also, uh, we see that, uh, uh, I'm just trying to, ah, yeah. Oops. My pen seems to have given up, uh, it's not writing. Uh, it's writing in red, so I'm sorry, the black one doesn't seem to be want to work anymore. So let's continue. Now the red one doesn't seem to want to work anymore. Let's try the blue one. Um, we also see, sorry. Hmm. We also see the following. Hmm we see that uh, by the definition, uh, if uh, the set of all x, where r of x is positive, by the definition uh, coincides with the set of all x uh, in the boundary of k for which n of x, n of x is unique. And I want to come back to this uh, uh, in a moment. So that's that. And um, now uh, let's move on and see uh, what we can do now that we have defined this um, uh, rolling function. So um, I'm 
thinking that I have forgotten to say something that uh, I wanted to say, but uh, no, I seem to have said everything that I wanted to say. So uh, let's see what we, uh, what the properties of these rolling functions are, and what uh, well, uh, and that uh, uh, will uh, then uh, help us to uh, move on proving the theorem. So uh, the now come properties of the rolling function, and that is due to Carson and myself. I'm really having problems with my pen. So what does the theorem say? Um, we'll look at, um, so let K be a convex body. In Rn, and we assume but that's just for scaling purposes. So that the next um, um, assumption that I make is not important. It's just, as I said, for scaling purposes, so such that the Euclidean ball uh, is contained in K. I could say five times the Euclidean. Sorry, Elizabeth. Is it uh, completely clear that for any, the previous statement, I mean, that for any boundary point when N is unique, uh, such ball exists with some radius? Uh, with some positive radius. So, so, um, so let me um, uh, think for a second. Uh, according to the definition, right? We'll look at. Yeah, we must uh, show that if an x is unique, then there exists such a ball with a positive radius. Right. Is it clear? Is it is it obvious? It is basically obvious. Um, the the other direction is of course immediate. Like yeah, the other is immediate, of course. If you have such a ball, uh, right? If you have such a ball existing, mm -hmm. uh, then the uh, outer yeah, normal then... Co coincides with the outer normal to the ball. So so th that is obvious. The other one is not immediately obvious. But uh, let me also the other one's not immediately obvious. I. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to, I will come back to that because I wanted to um, um, show as a corollary uh, of um, the theorem that I'm writing now, I wanted to show as a corollary some property about, uh, uh, about exactly okay, okay. things. You just said that it's by definition, so I was confused a little bit. No, okay. no, no. Um, one it. direction is obvious and the other one, mm -hmm. uh, We'll need it, or we'll see it mm -hmm. when I do a corollary okay, okay. the next theorem. Okay, so what's the next theorem? Uh, so let's see. Um, so we have a convex body in R n, and the uh, Euclidean ball. Not important if it's you uh, one times uh, that is the Euclidean ball, or one half the Euclidean ball, or five times the Euclidean ball. What um, a, a we have uh, is then that. Uh, for all zero less or equal t less or equal one. And uh, I can go up to t, uh, with t I can go up to one because I put uh, uh, one times the Euclidean unit ball. If I would have put one half, then I would go up to one half. So this is just, uh, as I said, scaling factor, which is uh, 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 corresponding to that situation here. So then for all t, we'll have what? We'll have the set of all x in the boundary of k for which um, r of x is bigger or equal than t. This is a closed set, uh, which uh, of course then implies that r is measurable. And that is that uh, the r is the rolling function. Maybe I should make this clear. Really not working well anymore. Uh, the rolling function. So R is measurable. Um, and that is important to us because actually we will not only want that the rolling function is measurable, we want uh, it actually that it is integrable over the boundary of K because that will be actually our dominating function for the expressions under the integral. The integral of 
that we had, uh, were, uh, how we had rewritten so far the volume difference. So, uh, so that's that. That's the first point. Then the second point is um, mu k, the volume of our um, x in uh, the boundary of k, for which we'll have that r of x is bigger or equal than t. The volume of that set is bigger or equal than one minus t to the n minus one times the bound volume of the boundary of k. Mm, okay, that's the second thing. And the third thing is that uh, the function, wow, uh, rho to the minus alpha, that goes from the boundary of k to uh, r, this is integrable for all a zero less or equal alpha less than one. And actually this is kind of important here. Uh, we can only expect strictly smaller than one. So that's the theorem. And I'm going to uh, first comment a little bit on the theorem. And then I'm going to prove at least uh, some things uh, concerning the theorem. Mm, uh, first, the first comment that I want to make is that uh, 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 concerns the inequality. So if the inequality is trivial for t equals zero and t equals one, because okay, like if t is equal to zero, then we look at um, the measure uh, or the set of uh, the, the volume n minus one dimensional volume of all those x in the boundary of k for which the uh, rolling ball uh, or r of x is bigger or equal than zero. And that is, of course, all of uh, the boundary of k by the way how we had defined the rolling function. Because if t is equal to zero, then here we'll get the whole boundary of k on the right and also on the left. So actually, in that case, if t is equal to zero, we'll have equality. And if t is equal to one, then, uh, well, the inequality is trivially true uh, as well, because on the right hand side, we'll have zero. So that's the one thing that I wanted to say uh, as a comment. And the other thing that I wanted to say as a comment um, is that um, the inequality in the statement is optimal. So the inequality hmm. Wow. Inequality is optimal. So how can we see this? Let's look at the cube. In, in Rn. Uh, let's take it with side lens two as I usually take. Uh, that is, uh, we look at uh, the um, unit ball of the L infinity norm. Then we'll see, okay, if, um, if, uh, T is given, then the last point, so to speak, on the boundary where I can put a ball with radius T uh, has distance from this vertex that is T and the same here. So the, uh, the points on the boundary uh, or the, 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 yeah, the points on the boundary uh, where I can put uh, uh, still a ball uh, centered at uh, 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 the point minus t times the normal uh, are at um, distance t from the vertices. So it's th this set here, so it's this set here on the boundary. So we are where we go everywhere t away. So we go everywhere t away. So in other words, it corresponds to if we were to um, you know write it uh, what it is it's like so. The points on the boundary correspond where uh, we can still put a ball with radius t. 
they are uh, so points on let's say uh, B, let's call it C, the infinity ball on the boundary of C, uh, such that uh, we can put a ball, uh, a, a ball, a rolling ball. Oh, with radius t is equals the cube with side lengths. 2 minus 2t. Two and okay, so then what's the n minus 1 dimensional volume of two uh, of this? So uh, 2 minus 2t uh, 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 dc, the n minus 1 dimensional volume, that is the, it is, uh, okay, it is 2 two to the n minus one, one minus t to the n minus one. And then we'll have to take um, uh, the number of, so, so that's, uh, that would be the, the volume of one facet. Um, and then we'll have to take times the number of, times the number of facets, if I manage to write this, which I'm not seem to be able to. So we have to multiply with two n. Uh, let's, let's try the blue. Mm. So this, this, this needs to be multiplied by 2n. I'm sorry, my pen refuses to write the 2n. Mm. Okay, but we understand what you are saying. <laughs> and that is equal to, and that is of course equal to one minus t to the n minus one, and together with the 2n would be giving us the boundary of the cube, which shows us that, uh, you know, the inequality is optimal, right? So y is not going. So nothing seems to work anymore. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that is why offline meeting is better than online. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons. <laughs> oh, I hope uh, I'll, I hope the thing uh, will start to cooperate again tomorrow. <laughs> Otherwise, we are in trouble. Um, yeah. So, so you understand? Do you understand? And you also understand? That's true. That it is pretty clear. Yes. Yeah, example. That this shows that the inequality is optimal, right? Yeah. For the cube, that's, we'll that's get actually true. equality. Yes, we, we can see this. Okay, good. Uh, I, uh, by, I also think we are lucky because uh, I think my time is up, right? Yes. And so you finished. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I cannot Thank write you. anymore. Very much. It was really interesting. And uh, uh, questions, please? Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, you have uh, your uh, uh, relation, limit relation, which, which gives us a fine surface area, right? Mm -hmm. Your theorem. And uh, non-affine counterexample is Minkowski uh, relation, right? Uh, Minkowski um, formula yes. for the, for so, the non-affine uh, surface area. Yes, for, for non-affine, yeah. And, so, but this Minkowski relation is actually a uh, corollary, a specific case of uh, standard formula, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So but my it, question you can, is, you can, you can see that. Um, Yes, because you can express, what did I write down? Yeah, so you can express. Yeah, 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 yeah. but question is uh, the following. May, may, maybe it is possible to obtain a fine if a counterexample for a standard polynomial. Of course, it's not polynomial. Maybe it would be some kind of Dirichlet series, which would give us uh, a fine uh, intrinsic volumes. I mean, oh, to... That is a good question. I'm so sorry that my pen doesn't write because this is, uh, if I understand your question correctly, let me try if my pen maybe does want to do something. Um, uh, we actually did look at uh, with, um, if I understand your question correctly, what we did, what I did. I mean, just another, with... another further asymptotic. Uh... Exactly. So, so that is one thing. And then what we just did with um, um, Katarina Tatako is we looked at the affine surface area of 
a body plus, so we did something similar that you observe in the um, um, Minkowski definition of usual surface area. So uh -huh. we looked at the affine surface area. Actually, we looked at a more general thing, which uh, will make sense once uh, I have uh, introduced it. So we looked at the affine surface area. So let's stay just with the usual affine surface area for the moment of a convex body K plus, and then we added on T or epsilon or say T uh, times Euclidean ball. And we expand that and we'll get an infinite series like a Steiner uh, uh, formula now uh, involving um, other coefficients than the ones that we have in the Steiner formula. But this leads us to define, so to speak, uh, uh, affine um, surface area uh, Steiner coefficients. Yes, so we did look at this just recently with uh, Katya. But maybe I, I think Dima asked something different. Maybe if I understand his question correctly, he asked whether it is possible to obtain an asymptotic expansion for the volume of K minus the volume want, of oh, K okay, delta, so if you the, assume that everything is different. Okay, if you can ex uh, identify the next term in the expansion, right? That's you right. asked. Yeah, yeah, but, but right. what and, and, you and, said is also very interesting, what you, what you, what you answered. Okay, so the next term in the expansion. It is, um, of course, conceivable to do such a thing. Um, the, if, you, if you assume that it is different, the calculations are very the calculations are very de delicate in higher dimensions, and but it has been done in dimension two by Matthias Weizner. So in dimension two, it has been done by Matthias. But in dimension two, uh, it's, the the next term is uh, something trivial, maybe or not. No, the next no? term, the, the terms yeah. are all, the terms are always of the power delta to the four. Well, the first one is delta to the two over n plus one. The yeah. next would be delta to the four over n plus one, and so on. Okay, so he published it somewhere. Yes, it is published. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so in dimension two, yes. Mm -hmm. um, in dimension higher, uh, dimension three and higher, as far as I know, no. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's of course interesting, but it's very delicate to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. And it involves, um, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, the expressions by Matthias involved something like uh, terms that uh, are called uh, uh, affine curvature. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions? Okay, if not, then thank you very much. Thank and you. also thank you to yeah. Manju. And uh, okay, we are meeting tomorrow at the same time as today. Okay, thank you. Thanks. See you.